Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul, aka your friendly neighborhood spoiler man, and I can't believe that we're finally in the endgame now. After an agonizing wait, Spider Man No Way Home is now out, and throughout this video, we're going to be breaking down the movie explaining the ending, and also talking about where the franchise could be going in the future. Your spoiler sense should be tingling right now as we're going to be going through it all, so if you haven't seen it then get out of here at breakneck speed like Gwen Stacy. You're my eyes and ears out here, so if you enjoy the video then please hit the thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe. With that out of the way, it's pizza time, now let's scooby do this shit and get into Spider-Man No Way Home. Okay, so if you're here without seeing the movie and just want to know whether the big leak was true or not, then I'll say up top that Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire are both in the film. Andrew is indeed the werewolf, we got to look at Tobey Maguire's dick, and I'm so glad that everyone who's been saying this for years can now rest. We can rest now. Beyond that though, No Way Home has a number of big surprises in it, and it's the most fun I've had in a theatre since Avengers Endgame. Now I am going to be calling the Spider-Men by their actor names, as referring to them as Peter 1, 2 and 3 will get confusing, but each one of them brings something special to the film. The movie picks up immediately after the events of Far From Home with Peter's identity out there, and he has to live with the repercussions of his newfound fame. They even got some of the actors back from that scene, including this guy, who shows up in both films. Nice. Now though his name is cleared by none other than Matt Murdock, his life and the life of his friends has been ruined by the court of public opinion and their applications to MIT are indeed rejected. The group can't get into any schools at all and it's clear that even though they didn't do anything wrong, they've been cancelled. Conspiracy theories surround the webhead and there's a large group of Team Mysterio that believe Peter is a murderer. Thus they have to move into Happy's apartment which just so happens to have Dummy there who you might recognise from the Iron Man movies. We also catch Delmon in Queens, which was a deli Peter visited in Homecoming, and he also wears a t-shirt that Tony gave him in that movie. Their lives are all ruined though, and thus Peter goes to Doctor Strange in order to erase this knowledge from everyone's minds so that his friends' lives can have somewhat normality. However, his constant interrupting during this causes it to shatter the multiverse, and it brings across people from other franchises that know Peter Parker is Spider-Man. This includes a number of his enemies, most notably the Green Goblin, who is played once more by Willem Dafoe. To make matters worse, the spell doesn't actually work, but we do end with it being cast once more, which pretty much just destroys all of the friendships and relationships that Peter has. Now they do change up some scenes from the trailers, namely the setup to the spell, and whereas the teasers had some corners of the internet believing that Strange was Mephisto, it's clear he's just trying to help Peter as best he can. See? See, I knew, I knew it couldn't be Mephisto, he, he doesn't exist. Now, the movie actually pulls from several comic storylines and it includes elements of Civil War, One More Day and also Happy Birthday. In the Civil War run, Peter unmasked for the entire world during a PR stunt to show the positives of the Superhuman Registration Act. This sent the Marvel Universe into a civil war in which Iron Man and Captain America went head to head over the Accords. Peter ended up switching sides from Tony to Steve, but with his identity already out there, it put those around him in a lot of danger. Kingpin sent assassins after him, and during an attack, they shot Aunt May and left her in critical condition. Desperate to save her life, Peter went to Doctor Strange in a rundown Sanctum Sanctorum and asked him to cast a spell that would allow him to delve into multiple timelines and ask for help from every scientific mind. However, they all said there was nothing that they could do, and thus Peter turned to someone else. Mephisto showed up to tempt Peter and he pledged to heal Aunt May, but in return he wanted Peter and Mary Jane's love. Peter and Mary Jane ended up sacrificing their marriage to save May, and to make sure that no one ever came after those he loved again, Peter also stipulated that the world had to forget he was Spider-Man. Beyond that, the Happy Birthday storyline had Dormammu attacking New York, and Peter interrupted a spell that Strange was casting, which opened up reality itself. Inside this void, Peter came across two versions of himself from the past and future, which of course reflects the other two Spider-Men that we get in this entry. And there are several easter eggs hinting towards their arrival, and lots of things that call back to the previous movies. This includes Toby's back being busted up, which in Spider-Man 2 was actually a nod to Toby sustaining a back injury that meant he was almost recast with Jake Gyllenhaal. Now after the villains are brought across, Peter ends up going to an MIT staff member to try and convince her to let his friends in. Before he has a chance to plead his case though, Dr. Octopus attacks and Peter ends up going head to head with him. 
During this battle, Ock actually slices Peter's tie off, and the suit and even the cut tie are callbacks to Spider-Man 3, when Tobey Maguire's version had the exact same thing happen to him. Peter manages to take control of his tentacles through the nanotech overriding them, and thus he's able to subdue Otto. However, the Green Goblin arrives, but just before Peter can take him on, he's transported below the Sanctorum, where Otto is imprisoned, along with the Lizard, who had a run-in with Strange. From this point on, Peter is ordered to capture the villains, along with Ned and MJ, and they have to scooby doo this shit. Not crap, shit. Now he finds Electro draining power out in the woods, and I need to jump over to the multiverse myself, cause man, the glow up on this dude is incredible. Here, Peter is helped by Sandman, but he ends up transporting them both to the prison, which sort of sows some seeds of doubt in the character that appear later on. Now, we also catch up with Osborne talking to his mask like in the movies, but he ends up smashing it before fleeing to feast. The way the mask is shattered does somewhat resemble the way that Toby dumped his costume behind in Spider-Man 2, and you do kind of get the feeling that Osborne may have defeated the darkness within him. After finding him at the shelter, May instills the idea on Peter that he has to help these people, and thus upon returning to the Sanctorum and finding that they're gonna die, he decides to take matters into his own hands. Peter ends up stealing the spell, which is contained within a cube known as the Cob... Cobalogic, Cobalog, Magic Box. Now this leads to a chase across the mirror dimension in which Peter Best Strange steals his sling ring and leaves him trapped there. He sets out to cure the villains and they return to Happy's home in order to use the machine that we saw in Far From Home. This can develop items to save them, the first of which is a chip to replace the broken one in Otto's neck and this will allow him to regain control of his mind. On a side tangent, whilst we're here, I never got why the miniature son was such a big draw in Spider-Man 2, when this guy had developed arms that he could control with his mind. Should have been a massive thing that they marketed there, but no, no, just kind of used it to control something else, and no one paid attention to them. Anyway, bit of a gripe there, and moving on. Now, Peter develops a device that can draw energy from Electro, and along with Norman, they start to work on removing the Goblin. However, this ends up taking over Norman, and it talks Electro into destroying the device so that they can become gods in this reality. Electro steals the arc reactor that's powering the workbench, Sandman leaves, and Lizard runs off into the night. With news cameras at the scene and being attacked by his own pals, Otto flees too, which leaves Peter and the Goblin to go head to head. Osborne easily bests him, and in the lobby he knocks May down with his glider before launching a pumpkin bomb at her. Initially she seems fine, however in the wreckage she collapses and dies after saying, with great power comes great responsibility. I, w I wasn't crying, yeah, you, you were crying, and Happy is arrested at the scene. He then screams, run Peter, run, and then your boy flees to a rooftop where he spent a lot of time with MJ away from the world. Now across town, Ned and MJ are desperate to find him, and using Stranger's sling ring, the former manages to open a portal upon saying that he wishes he could find Peter Parker. This not only brings across Andrew, but later Toby when the spell is repeated, and this scene is one of the most impactful ones I've seen in a cinema for a long time. It was so good seeing them back, and Garfield especially knocks it out of the park whenever he's on screen. Now though Ned Leeds in the comics went on to become the Hobgoblin, it does seem like they're doing something different with him and that he'll become a sorcerer at some point. After getting some lip service to Harry Osborn, he does vow to never turn on Peter, but in the aftermath of the ending, who knows if that's going to be the case. Now Toby, Andrew and Tom have some incredible scenes together that touch upon Gwen, Uncle Ben, the web shooters, and there's even references to the Spider-Man pointing meme. Together they create cures for the villains and announce through the Daily Bugle that they'll all be at the new and improved Statue of Liberty. This is where it all goes down, and together the Spider-Men work with one another to administer the cures. These include the one seen at the end of The Amazing Spider-Man, a reverse collider for Sandman, and Ock shows up to help out with Electro. Everything is coming up Millhouse until the Green Goblin arrives. He ends up grabbing the cube and putting a pumpkin bomb in it, which blows reality wide open, and we start to see several villains entering the MCU. This includes the likes of the Rhino, either Scorpion or a Spider Slayer, and there's several amongst this that would completely decimate the world. Ned and MJ are pulled into the fray, but Andrew gets his redemption when he saves MJ from falling, which is something that he couldn't do with Gwen. Peter almost kills Goblin for what he did to May, but at the last second he stopped from ramming a glider into his face by Toby Maguire. Toby gets stabbed, but Andrew tosses the cure to Tom, who injects Goblin and then cures him of his Kevin Spoiler's side. The villains and their Spider-Men have mended their relationships, 
and they'll now return to their own universes to escape the deaths that were bound to happen with them. May very much instilled in Tom the idea that if he saves one person, he saves everyone, and thus he stopped a lot of heartbreak from happening in other realities. However, reality is still tearing apart, but Peter realises that if Strange casts the spell to make everyone forget he's Spider-Man, that this will stop it from ripping open. He has a tearful goodbye with MJ, and promises that he'll come and tell both her and Ned about himself, so that they can remember him once more. He ventures out to where MJ works one day, and the emotion in the scene is absolutely incredible. It's clear he has this entire thing planned out, and that he knows exactly what he wants to say, but when Ned enters and the pair talk about MIT, he starts to have second thoughts. MJ even has the black dahlia necklace that he bought her in Far From Home, but she simply can't remember that they've ever met. After noticing a band-aid covering a cut that she got at the Statue of Liberty, he decides to leave both her and Ned, as she seems happier and being close to him will only put her in danger. This was very much a motif that was brought up at the end of the first Raimi film, and Peter had to turn away from the person he loved in order to spare them the pain that his lifestyle would cause. It's completely devastating, and it's arguably one of the most painful endings to an MC movie ever. To make matters worse, Peter visits May's grave, and he's then joined by Happy, who doesn't recognise him either. However, he alludes to Tony and what May's death meant, which pushes Peter on even though he's now at his lowest point. You could play Lonely by Akon over these scenes, and we end with him moving into his first apartment by himself. Though there's no Mr. Dikovich here, he'll clearly start using this as a base of operations, and he'll continue to help people. Peter is picking up police frequencies, and he's also made his costume, which looks just like the classic suit that comes from the comics. It's a bittersweet ending that shows Peter has been inspired by those he loves, and though they've forgotten what he meant to them, he hasn't forgotten what they meant to him. Now there are a couple of things I want to touch upon, and with the villains getting reformed and sent back to their own timelines, we could be getting some big things down the line. Though no sequels have been announced, Sony are never ones to turn down paychecks, and we could potentially get another Maguire or Garfield film, and potentially even one for the bad guys. Them being reformed could somewhat be hinting at a possible Dark Avengers group headed up by none other than Norman Osborn. In the comics after the events of Civil War, Osborn was appointed to create his own team of superheroes, and with this being so closely linked to the events of the comics, we may be heading in that direction. Lady Loki was also a member, and with a Disney Plus show Loki introducing a similar character to her, that could be the way that they're heading. There's also some lip service given to Miles Morales, as Electro says he hopes there's a universe out there where Spider-Man is black. As for Peter and MJ, knowing that he had to sacrifice their love in order for her to be okay is something that stuck with me long after I left the theatre. As we mentioned earlier, this is somewhat similar to the One More Day storyline in which their love was taken away from them. Whilst the devil who's always in the details doesn't show up in this movie, it's clearly centred around that idea and we could use the comics to guess where things are going. Now MJ and Peter weren't always together in the source material, and at one point she actually dated Brad, who you might remember from Far From Home. Brad and MJ were somewhat getting close in that film, but MJ went all in with Peter after learning he was Spider-Man. However, without this knowledge, it might mean that she did go back to him. Now as for the future, I think this might actually open up the possibility that another love interest could enter Peter's life. Though Garfield's version of the character somewhat hinted towards Gwen, I could see her coming into the MCU, and who knows, we may even get a version of Spider-Gwen in this universe. However, it could also allow Marvel Studios to introduce Black Cat, who at the moment hasn't really featured in a film. Though Felicity Jones played Felicia in Amazing Spider-Man 2, she and Peter never came face to face and she didn't get to don her costume either. So I would love to see her get brought into the films as I think that would really add an interesting dynamic to the MCU. Felicia brings a lot of attitude to the character and who knows, Tom's version might end up getting some too if more of his personality aspects are enhanced by what's left behind in the post credit scene. I'm not going to talk about the second one in this video, and if you're here without watching the movie, then I'll just say that that's because it's actually a trailer for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I'm going to save my breakdown of that until after that releases online to promote the film, as I'd rather just do a separate video. What I want to talk about though is the one involving Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock, which follows on from the events of Venom Let There Be Carnage. In that movie we watched as Venom was about to show Eddie a fraction of what his species had done to the cosmos, but they were pulled across into the MCU. On a TV in the hotel room, we saw as a news report by J. Jonah Jameson announced that Spider-Man was Peter Parker, and Venom said he looks tasty before licking the screen. Now all you people who thought that Venom was gonna be in the MCU, 
you'll probably be disappointed by the post credit scene as it sends him home just as quickly as he arrived. Honestly, it kind of feels like Foggy just allowed Venom to come into the MCU so that they could yoink the symbiote off him and then send him back to the Sonyverse, aka hell. Just kidding, Sony. I love you. Now, Eddie is in Mexico and he's sat at a bar getting filled in on the events of the past. He's shocked to learn that there's tons of superheroes in this reality, as in his, he's the only one. He recounts things like Iron Man and says there's a belly now with a tin suit that can fly, an angry green man and a purple alien who loves stones. Eddie then says that maybe he should go to New York and speak to this Spider-Man before being pulled out of the MCU. Whilst his stay was short and sweet, he does leave behind a piece of the symbiote on the bar, which now has the idea instilled in it that it should travel to NYC. I'm sure all of you know that in the comics, Peter ends up getting a black suit during the events of Secret Wars, which later turns out to be a parasitic symbiote that brings out the darker parts of his personality. Peter managed to remove this, and it ended up infecting a rival at the Daily Bugle named Eddie Brock. Now, we don't know whether the Eddie Brock of this universe will be played by Tom Hardy or not, but the way that things have been done is a bit weird. Originally, Marvel Studios didn't have the rights to use Venom, so Sony went ahead with their own franchise. I kind of hope the one from the Sonyverse does get pulled across, otherwise the order of things will basically be that we get a Venom in a separate universe who's completely unaware of Spider-Man, he goes into the MCU, leaves behind some of the symbiote, goes back to his own universe, that symbiote then attaches to Peter, we then get the Black Suit Saga which ends with Eddie being infected, which seems like the weirdest way that they could have laid this all out. Saying that though, I am excited to see what they do, and it has been reported that Tom Holland has signed on to do three more solo Spider-Man movies. I think that Harry Osborn could potentially be introduced during this time, and other characters like Felicia, who would complement the personality changes that the Venom symbiote brings out. As long as we don't get any dancing down the street, it should be good, and it's going to be interesting to see how they take things. We might even get another Gwen Stacy arc, and though some people could think it's too soon after Garfield to do that, we did have Mary Jane with Toby and then MJ in the MCU. I can imagine they'd handle Gwen completely differently like how they did with MJ, and it'll be interesting to see the direction that they take things. I do however want to see Peter back with MJ, and I just hope that they get get their happy ending. And I'm not I'm not I'm not crying either. Now that kind of takes me into my thoughts on the film, and though I loved it, I did have some issues with it early on. I think it's only fair to talk about both my negatives and positives, as I'm not someone who just wants to say, everything's amazing, best movie ever, no problems. Now, I did feel like the first hour was pretty choppy and a bit all over the place at points. I think the issue was that it had to wrap up the Mysterio cliffhanger, whilst also setting up the multiverse storyline, so some things didn't get the proper time and development that I believe they required. Now, I had some weird issues whilst I was watching at the cinema, and they actually ended up having to restart the film five times. I saw the first 10 minutes over and over and over again because the cinema had an issue that they just couldn't seem to fix, and thus, that might be a factor as to why I was a bit meh on the opening. However, as soon as Willem Dafoe enters the movie, the film gets incredible, and it somehow gets better and better every single scene. Though a lot of this movie was leaked, Going into it and watching the moments play out was so much fun, and it's going to be interesting to see if Marvel can top this. I know that everyone said Avengers Endgame was the peak, but I feel that this is up there in bringing so many elements from the past together to tell an incredible story. Tobey Maguire brings a real wisdom to the screen, and Garfield for me, he's my favourite Spider-Man ever at this point. Now there's also that heartbreaking ending, which I actually think might be the best ending to a Marvel movie ever. It's difficult to think what I'd put above it, and it just shows the sacrifice that comes with being a hero. Though I did have problems with the first hour, they were long forgotten when we properly got into the movie, and I was enjoying it so much that I felt strange and cast a memory spell on me. All the issues just went away, and I loved the hell out of it. This is definitely the best MCU Spider-Man film, and though I'd still play Spider-Man 2 and Into the Spider-Verse above it, I still had such a good time with it. Spider-Man No Way Home was brilliant, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts, so make sure you comment below and let me know. If you want some else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Hawkeye, which will be linked on screen right now. We've gone over the entire thing from top to bottom and talking about all the easter eggs in it, so definitely go check it out right after this. With that out of the way, thank you for seeing through the video, I've been Paul, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, peace.